Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for our first storyteller of the evening, Sabrina Nelson. <laughs> It is 1991, and I am about 25 years old. I'm not feeling good about myself at this moment. I'm not feeling very attractive, because I'm in love with someone who's loving someone else. My mother says, let's go to Jamaica. And I say, I can't, I can't leave the kids at home and go to Jamaica. She's like, them kids going to be all right. They're going to be with their daddy. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> let's go to Jamaica. So I invite my best friend, her best friend goes. We fly from Detroit to Montego Bay, Mo Bay. Now we arrive, it's hot, it's beautiful. I have never been. I think my mother has been and I think her friend has been. My friend has not. We're on the shuttle on our way to the hotel. My window is down. And I'm sitting there and I hear this man come to the window and he comes to the side and he says, hey, I do your nails, I can do your hair, I can do your makeup, I can even do your poom poom. <laughs> now, I'm real busy trying to figure out what the poom poom is. And I understood the patois enough to, to hear that. And I, I look around the, the shuttle and everybody's face is like, and then I decide I don't want this man to do my poom poom. <laughs> so we head to Mobay. We're there for a few days. And this trip is sort of planned, whether it's something that they planned or not. We end up in Negril. Now, I'm just going along, and I'm not sure about Jamaica, except for what I've seen on the commercials. And we get to this 10-mile beach, and it's beautiful. And we decide to walk along the shore for miles, hours, I think. As we're walking along, the four of us, I see my first sign, that's a warning sign, and it says, because I can read really well, it says, nude beach ahead. <laughs> now, I'm behind the folks, because I'm enjoying this, and I, I, we're walking, and as we walk along this beach, we pass this woman with her top bear, and she's beautiful, we acknowledge her, we give her the what up dough, she gives us the, <laughs> you know, she don't say nothing, we cool. We still walking now. Our walk is kind of slow, but all of a sudden it starts to get to a gallop. I'm in the back of this line. We walking, and I notice the walk is speeding up. I see my second warning sign. It says, new beach ahead. Now, after a while, I'm trying to get the attention of the folks that I'm walking with. And I'm like, hey, 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 y'all, because we've been separated a little bit. I'm like, hey, and in the distance, I see a sea of red and pink and white old bodies. <laughs> spread out all over the beach. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, OK. And there's another sign. And they're really walking fast. And we're almost running. Now, at this point, I'm turning seven years old. And I'm like, wait, mom, 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 mom. Wait, hold up. I ain't, I ain't ready. Hold up, mom. <laughs> this, ain't, this ain't what I, anyway. We, we pretty much there. Everybody is almost naked that I'm with. Now. We've come upon this beach. They didn't found chairs. I'm still talking about, look here, I'm not, I don't want to do this. I'm not, I'm not feeling this. And Kim, why are you taking off your clothes? And <laughs> I'm picking up clothes, and I'm turning seven, but I'm everybody's mama, and I'm upset. And I'm upset because there are watchers there. Now, they have on tan uniforms, and the watchers are what one might, might call security guard. Now, they black. And their eyes are getting fed with my mother's beautiful body. She's in her 40s. Everything is good. She's real comfortable. She naked. <laughs> She's sitting on a seat, and I'm like, listen, I'm not, I, don't, I, they, I don't want you looking at my mama. Quit looking at my mama. All of a sudden, I'm complaining. My mom goes, hey, girl, hey, I'm going to need you to calm down. <laughs> we ain't never got to see none of these folks no more. They don't know us. We don't know them. We on a beach in Jamaica. And I'm like, oh, OK. She reading her book, and I'm just sitting there. I'm pissed. And then after a while, I realized that you know I've been given a lesson here. I've been given some jewels, some pearls of wisdom that we are in Jamaica, and I'm missing out on this beautiful moment because I'm not happy. And they are really enjoying themselves. So I've learned that that's one of the pearls that I've gotten. Now, 
It is 1998, some years later. And I'm at Intermezzo's down in Harmony Park. And there's a bar side to it. And in the bar, there's only nine of us in there, including the bartender. All of a sudden, I hear a little bit of noise from the other side. And in walks through the door, Prince, Larry Graham, Stevie Wonder, and Cat Dyson, his musical director. Prince is a musical director. So I'm a little shocked because Stevie Wonder is king in my house. And I'm like, damn, that's Stevie Wonder. <laughs> in a vision. Anyway, they come in. And we are not fanatics about them coming in. We're really quiet. It's a weekday. I'm on a date. We're at the bar. All of a sudden, someone goes up to the bar and asks the band who's playing, which is really a trio, can they do a jam session? Of course, yeah. So as they're switching out, Prince, who's standing directly in front of me at the bar, right here, and Stevie Wonder, who's an arm's length away. I'm like, Stevie Wonder, man. Prince looks directly at me, right in my eyes. And I notice, I look at him, and he says, you're beautiful. And I say, thank you. That was when I realized, OK, I'm born for this. <laughs> I believed him. I was born August 26, 1967, 34 days after the Great Rebellion here in this city. Also, August 26 is the day the 19th Amendment passed for women's suffrage. So I was born to be beautiful, to be rebellious, and to be free. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I was born in a house with three women <laughs> that made a very huge impact on my life, my great-grandmother, my grandmother, and my mother. Often people in my family tell me I'm very much like my grandmother Thelma, or Dow, as our family would call her. She was a member of the Freemasonic Eastern Star, where they held many meetings and many secrets. Her and her best friend and cousin, Carrie Love, made their garments just for those meetings and those parties. Her clothes were beautiful. They were kept in a chiffon robe or either in a cedar chest, depending on what the season was. My mother, Yvette, was also really, really beautiful. And I wanted to be just like these women. My grandmother, because she did everybody's taxes in the neighborhood, I thought of her as being very smart. And either she was the numbers lady or she played the numbers. But <laughs> I wanted to be like these women in my house that were smart, beautiful, and, and just really, really powerful. My mom was young and well with the times, and she had a blonde afro, and she had like skin tight bell bottom pants and platform shoes and everything she wore I thought was amazing. She didn't think her legs were big enough, but the men who pursued her thought they were just fine. <laughs> so in this house, I learned how to be just like them. I wanted to be just like them. I wanted to dress like them. My grandmother held a Phyllis Dilla cigarette holder. I wanted to do that too. <laughs> she also held her pinky up when she ate her food. I thought that was unique and also very classy. My great-grandmother was classy and traditional. So in this house with these women, I watched them. I got my hair done in the kitchen like many folks I know, where we would hold our ear down so that we wouldn't get burned from the pressing cone. <laughs> now, while I was holding my ear, I was being seen and not heard as a child should be in my family. I also would get my hair braided often, and I would learn and listen, and I was a sponge. I was learning how to be a diva like my family, a diva in training. So <laughs> from that moment, I'm learning many, many things. It is now 1972. I am five years old. I'm in kindergarten. And I remember Billy Paul singing, me and Mrs. Mrs. Jones. Now, I couldn't figure out why he was singing about my kindergarten teacher or what she had did to really get him to sing this song, but I figured it was something, and I knew the energy of that song. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> it is now 1979. I'm 12 years old. I can draw very well, and I can make things with my hands just like my grandmother. My sisters, Denise and Sharnita, however, they are the recipients of very large posteriors. <laughs> they have large breasts, really nice ones, 
They have new followers, friends, they know how to cuss, they smoke. They're on the cheer team, they can dance. I can't do none of that. I didn't get none of those gifts and I couldn't hang out with them because I was in the IBTC, itty bitty titty committee. So I couldn't hang with them and I'm okay with that because I've made up. Uh, but <laughs> at 14, I finally grew something. I also was, had a little shape and I'm also in my first year in high school. And that was in 1981. And so that escalated really fast because in 1982, after gaining a lot of attention from lots of boys, I had my first child. Now, I had my first daughter who I birthed, but she birthed me a new attitude, a new way of thinking, a new way of being, also a new body, <laughs> and new responsibility, new power. So with that, I'm one of the youngest mother at the parent-teacher conference, and I don't have power, I'm invisible, because they won't listen to me at these meetings. By 1987, I'd had my second child, that's Mario. By then, I realized that I have pretty power, and I'm going to have a voice, and they're gonna realize how smart I am, and I'm a great mother, so I'm gonna use that, so hopefully they don't see this first. I'm in college, and I'm learning how to be an artist. By the time I get out of college, I'm invited to these great grand parties where artists, collectors, and many, many gallerists are there. Now, I get invited to this party in 1992, and I'm invited to this event that's held at um, 1300 East Lafayette, my first time being in the building, kind of hanging out there. But this, this party is from this great collector who is hosting Benny Andrews, who's an amazing artist. I'm excited to be there. I decide I'm gonna wear this Phyllis Hyman hat with this beautiful scarf, this grown lady red lipstick, and I'm gonna wear an outfit called multiples. With multiples, you can either make them short or long. I decide to go short, like really, really short. I step off the elevator, the doorman opens the door and he says, come on in. I step in the room, the room changes, everyone looks at me and I'm like, did I come at a wrong time? Or, and I get it together and walk in and people start introducing me as a fabulous artist. And then the gallerist noticed that I'm there, but she didn't invite me, the collector did. I'm talking to another collector, she comes over, she introduces me formally to the collector and she said, this is Sabrina Nelson, she's a fabulous artist. All of a sudden, the collector says, hey, can you tell me about your artwork? This is everything, because I get to talk about my artwork. As I proceed, the gallerist stops her from talking. She's a very tall woman, beautiful, definitely model-esque. She bends down and stops me and says, excuse me, baby, what kind of lipstick is that you wearing? <laughs> I say, oh, I don't know, it's some red something I got from Chicago, I don't know. She says, oh, okay, if I give you some money, can you go to that store and get that lipstick and bring it to the gallery? And I, I was like, oh, she's a gallerist, okay, I'm an artist, I need to be cool with this. I'm like, yeah, absolutely, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> she whisked off the collector and my feelings are hurt and I'm pissed off because I, I was talking about my stuff, my passion. I realized that because of my facade that maybe I wasn't taken seriously and then I realized that I have to take that power back. So it is now 1998 and um, actually it's 1992, Prince and the Power, New Power Re Re Revolution? Thank you. They come out with the, they release the single for a sexy motherfucker. And I realize it's not about pretty, it's about power. I'm at the point in my life where I need to take that power and allure and use it for good. I live in a house with these women that I've learned these things from and I've started to dissect what sexy means. I start to ask my friends, but I start off with, you're one of the sexiest women I know. When did you know you were sexy? And is it a verb or a noun? We all agree that it's definitely an action verb. It's a noun, it's about allure, it's about using your eyes, your voice, your movements, your body, but also your intellect. We're taking it back from the idea that it only belongs to young, thin women, and we're giving it a whole new definition. I did um, have some changes that happened in the year 2000. 30, uh, I was 33 years old. I had my third child almost 16 years ago now, and <laughs> Also, that also changed the perspective of me as being the youngest parent at one point and now one of the older parents. <laughs> so now I have a voice, but I also have the power to say, if there's a younger parent in the room, let's hear what she has to say. So, 
Thank you. In 2005, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer, and uh, her change happened. When she had to go through her treatments, I asked her, I said, if your hair falls out, can I have it? And she was like, you know, you're a strange one, but it's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. She came over my house one day with a golden box, and it literally was a golden box. Inside that box were her locks, and her locks are golden. I opened the box, and there were about 72 of them. I counted. When she handed me the box, she said, do something good with this. And I said, okay. To me, that was her handing me her crown. To me, that was her saying that sometimes you have to surrender to life with the things that happens, but you have to walk in it with you know, your passion and also with your purpose. So in this moment, knowing what sexy is and how I define it as intellectual, as a verb, as a noun, also as an action word, I know that in my 49th year that I'm okay with it, I'm okay with using the word, but also knowing that what my place is in this world and in my 50th year for next year, I have to know what to do with that. With great power comes great responsibility. Thank you. Sabrina Nelson.